I got our um, Old Testament lesson this morning is from Genesis 29, beginning at the 15th verse. And uh, as we recall last uh, week, uh, Jacob was on his way to Haran to go um, meet up with his uncle because he was running away from home uh, at peril of his life because his brother was ready to kill him. And so we pick up this morning. Then Laban, Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what, Laban, what is this you've done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went in to Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban another seven years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard the saying, the best laid plans of mice and men do often go asunder. Or how about the saying, we make plans and God laughs. <laughs> I am sure there are many other sayings that express the same idea. No matter how well we plan for things, there always seems to be something that messes uh, up our plans. Life rarely goes the way we plan. Certainly, Jacob found that out when he tried to marry Rachel. Now, for the past couple of weeks, we've been following the life of Jacob, and we've learned he was quite the swindler and quite the trickster, and we learned how um, he, that he wound up uh, plotting so that um, it got him into a lot of trouble with his uh, brother and with his father. And his brother had uh, threatened his life, and so he was forced to run for his life, Jacob was. Then last week we heard how Jacob, while on the run, uh, was visited by God at Bethel and how he made an altar there. And it was there that Jacob made a promise, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. I love that he figures he can schmooze God, that he can negotiate with God for a good deal here. 
Anyway, God has already promised him a good deal. So that he's trying to negotiate is a bit of a joke in itself. Well, Jacob continues on to Haran with uh, the object of finding a wife and biding some time while his brother cools off. And it is there that he meets Rachel. And it was love at first sight. So he strikes a deal with Laban to work for Laban for seven years in order to earn Rachel's hand. And Jacob figures out that if he works for seven years and gets what he wants, and then he can get out of there and head back home and all will be right with the world. So he works his seven years and the Lord is with him. Laban's wealth prospers under Jacob's guidance. And so Jacob finally wins Rachel. And lo and behold, we pick up with the story that we heard today. The trickster, however, is tricked. On his wedding night, Jacob, the one who deceived his blind father, is also the one who does not see until it is too late, and he compromises this lovely girl, Leah. And in the morning when he discovers this uh, switch, that his bride is Leah and not Rachel, he is irate. And so he goes to Laban and complains. And Laban explains the tradition that, you know, the oldest must be married first. And so Jacob agrees to work another seven years. So Laban has gotten the best of this deal. He's gotten 14 years of cheap labor for uh, just a couple daughters and a couple maids. And the thing of it is, it's interesting that with each daughter, the father gives a maid a servant. And, when we th and the thing of it is, we now have four women that are connected with Jacob. And so it is that um, Jacob, in, Jacob begins to prosper because the Lord is with him. And if we were to continue in this story, we find out that Rachel is barren, a theme that we've heard before. But the other three women bear Jacob ten sons. And eventually, Rachel does bear Jacob two more sons. So among these four women, the two uh, maid servants, the two daughters, um, we also find that there are, that Jacob is uh, blessed with 12 sons. And these become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And lest we forget, somewhere in all that mix, Jacob also has a daughter, and her name is Dinah. She has her own story, and it's a fun story, but we won't get into that today. God has promised Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, that he would make for him a great nation, and his descendants would be more than the stars. And true to God's words, it is through Jacob that this population explosion took place. God intended to create a great nation that would bless all the kingdoms. And God works this out through this flawed man, Jacob. And the truth of the matter is, when God is at work, things may not always work out the way we expect them to or the way we plan them to, but they always work out for good because the love of God has for his creation is a love that transforms even the most dire situations. And I certainly found out the hard way that the best laid plans don't always work out uh, the way we think they should. It, I wound up in a divorce after 27 years of marriage. But I have to laugh because I have at home this little booklet that I made as a junior in high school. And I've been unable to throw it away because it was my life plan about 
how I was going to go to college, then get married, have three children, a pretty house. I would grow old with my husband. We would have grandchildren. It was going to be great. And then I would say my goodbyes, et cetera, et cetera. Nowhere in there was there anything about seminary. <laughs> Nowhere in there was anything about divorce. Nowhere in there was anything about interim ministry. It just didn't make sense to me. And I can't help but chuckle when I read the story I wrote. Because things sure did not go the way I had planned. But, you know, I made choices. Maybe they were part of God's plan or maybe they weren't. And I have to be honest, I hesitate to talk about God's plan because I really have a hard time with a God who allowed 5,000 people to go to work one morning only for them to be killed because of terrorists. Or who wipes out 100,000 people in a tsunami. And I have a hard time talking about God's plan to a mother whose 16-year-old daughter was brutally murdered by the boy next door. And I have problems talking about God's plan when a man watches his beloved wife suffer from a particularly aggressive form of MS. My life certainly wasn't what I expected, but... Lo and behold, here I am. And as Paul would say, if God is for us, who can be against us? And he also reminds us, all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Like a loving parent, God's plan is for our good. God wants what is good for us and for all of creation. That is God's plan. God's plan is to restore creation, to work through a flawed humanity and through flawed systems and flawed governments to bring about our good. It's not always apparent when evil seems to be winning the day, when life is getting us further and further down. And there is a saying, when you are up to your butt in alligators, it's hard to remember that the original plan was to drain the swamp. <laughs> Sometimes when life is getting us down or when we don't see a way, we really start to question God's plan. Yet God wants good for us because God loves us because like a parent God cares about us and cares about his church here on earth cares about us as individuals cares about all of creation and if we just but trust God's leading and trust that God does indeed want what's good for us we his children then we can also trust that God will work with us to realize God's plan, God's vision for God's new creation. And I would say, even here at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Dallas, Pennsylvania, God loves us. We were planted here for a reason. And even though we have our challenges ahead of us, if we but trust God's leading and trust that God wants good for us and for this community that we serve, then indeed we will see the way that God has planned for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Having heard God's word, proclaimed and read to us, let us now um, affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. They can be found on page 14. Let us stand.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.